standing as we are, let us pray. Indeed, our Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of mercy with a thirst for your word. And our prayer is that more, more about you, we may get to learn, we may get to know, so that you may inspire our hearts to love you, to honor you, and to serve you faithfully. Be with us, minister to us, for we are waiting. For this is our prayer of faith, in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Shall we be seated? Praise the Lord, church. Hallelujah. Amen. We thank God for granting us an opportunity to be here in this service. And I'm so glad that the Lord has continued to watch over us and that we have made it to be here this morning. For the purposes of those that we could be meeting for the first time, my name is Pauline Kanuthu. I am born again, and I continue to thank the Lord for being a faithful friend, a friend who sticks closer than, a, than anyone else, and um, a shepherd who has continued to guide and to lead me all the way. I want to take this opportunity before we bring the message to us to mention a few things. Number one is that on Sunday we attended Reverend PK's induction, some of us, and he sent out his uh, message of appreciation. Kindly receive it. It's only that the chairman has forgotten to mention, so he's reminded, he's requested me to do it on his behalf. So kindly receive that appreciation, and we continue to wish him well, even as he serves. Secondly, 70 years uh, celebration are here with us. Remember to visit the desk so that you can make sure that you buy for yourself an item. It's one way of uh, ensuring that uh, we celebrate our church, we celebrate what the Lord has done, but also raise resources that can help us to do ministry. So please, please make sure you visit the canopy you will find some wonderful people sitting there and they are looking forward to serve all of us. We have more than enough items for each one of us. You can even buy for a friend, even as you invite them to consider joining us for the celebrations. Uh, finally, we have a pastoral letter that we have received and the pastoral letter is for the entire Presbyterian Church. We've already sent out the letter in our respective uh, groups and even districts, kindly go through that letter. And uh, the key thing in that letter is that we are being called to prayer. And before this service ends, we will take a few minutes to pray. And uh, we will pray for the nation. We will also remember the children in schools. Over the recent few days, we have seen fires here and there. And it is important to pray that the Lord will watch over the children. We have also witnessed several accidents. And it's also good to pray for protection, road safety as people travel, corruption and many other things. So we are calling upon us as a church to be able to unite in prayer as we call on our Heavenly Father because there is nothing that is impossible with Him. So kindly look at it and the items that are listed there. Take it upon yourself throughout the week to mention them to the Lord. And as we meet again, we will be meeting now to give thanks for what the Lord will have done. I invite you to uh, share with me the message for today. And today we are talking about discipleship. The message today is discipleship. And um, when I thought about discipleship, I quickly remembered the story of a young man who was worshipping in a congregation like we are worshipping today. And for the purposes of this service, I choose to call that young man David. That is not his real name though. And so David was excited when he received the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal saviour. You know, he was this person who was always coming to church and everyone knew him because should there be any church activity, he was always involved. He participated in many groups, and um, many times he even led uh, worship services, like a worship service, the one we have here. And uh, so he was a person who was known. 
And any time he would come to church, he would carry this uh, big Bible. You know, he even had a hymn book, you know, a true Presbyterian. Eh? Hymn book, Bible, notebook, pen. And so that's how he was known. And uh, one day, a certain, uh, another, maybe I can call this other person, John, for the purposes of this service. So John, uh, John joins this church. And as he joins this church, it was easy to notice David. And soon they become uh, friends. And he's also excited with uh, what David is doing in the services. And as they begin to interact, uh, John had a great desire to grow in his spiritual journey. And uh, as they interacted, he realized that uh, David, his friend, in church, he was this kind of a person who was known, very active, committed, and all this. But back at home, that was not the story. He was a person who uh, was struggling with issues of temper, you know? And uh, any words would go for him. He was also a person who neglected his family. He wasn't very keen taking care of his family. So his family members were crying, you know, they were not happy with him as much as the church and the community out there was excited about what he was doing. He even visited him a couple of times at his place of work and realized that uh, this person would get late and uh, no apologies, you know, and even how he was serving other people, uh, he wasn't keen in terms of uh, investing, you know, in those relationships as people came into, uh, into the place where he was working, as he was rendering his services. And uh, John thought to himself, you know, when I came to church, my greatest desire was to grow and grow in my journey, to get to know the Lord more. And so he decided on his own capacity to join in Bible study groups that were available in the church. And uh, he was very intentional about it. So he would sit there, listen to the word, learn. And eventually, many things began to make sense to him. He got to know that there's a difference between going to church, which is actually um, what people would think that is what discipleship is, and what we would call spiritual growth. You can go to church, you can be in a district, you can even sing in the choir, in the praise team, you can even be an usher, you can be a deacon, you can be a wonderful person serving in the Women's Guild, the PCMF. You know, you have paid all your subscriptions, anything that needs to be paid for. I mean, tithe, perfect, doing well, but discipleship is over and above that. And that is what John discovered. So when he discovered that, he decided to live his life differently. And with time, his friend David realized that John was different. And as a result, out of their friendship and relationship, eventually David uh, changed positively. And um, even now back at home, everyone would have a different story about him. And this morning, I invite us, as we go through the readings we have, and as we think about discipleship to ask ourselves, what is the Lord calling us to do this morning? And when you think about uh, the church today as it is, uh, many times we consider true discipleship as being involved, you know, in uh, Sunday services, attendance, and we are very keen to, where were you on Sunday, which is very good. But uh, discipleship goes beyond attending services. Sometimes we think about participating in various church groups or fulfilling certain roles within the church or within any faith community. However, these activities alone do not capture the essence of true discipleship. And uh, there's a person who said that the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. Praise be to God. The church is the only society, the only institution, the only organization that exists for the benefits of those who are not its members. If today you joined uh, PCA Bahati Mateas uh, circle, uh, and there are any benefits, there are any dividends that are going to be declared by the end of the year, 
The only people who are going to benefit from those dividends are people who are actually members of their circle. If you are not a member of the circle, you cannot share dividends. You cannot even benefit from any loan facility that they are going to offer. But the church is different. It exists for the benefit of people who are not necessarily its members. And that basically means that uh, when we talk about discipleship, you know, it's all about um, not just we who are here, but also thinking about those others. How we, how we do whatever it is that we do should have an impact not only on us as we sit here in this congregation today, but also in the community around, in our homes, in our places of work. And uh, when you think about all this, then we ask ourselves, what is discipleship then? And we can say that uh, discipleship is, um, is beyond what we would call outward participation. It requires transformation. Discipleship is that deliberate and intentional commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we follow him, we also learn from his teachings. And we, as we learn from his teachings, we allow those teachings to reshape our lives so that finally we can also go out there with great commitment to make disciples for him. Praise be to God. True discipleship is uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, learning from his teachings, allowing those teachings to shape our lives, but over and above that, to go out there and make an impact for him, make others desire to follow him. It's what Jesus Christ was telling his disciples to do when he said in Matthew 28, what we actually call the Great Commission, that go out there teaching people, you know, instructing them, baptizing them, you know, making them disciples, not making them churchgoers, but making them disciples. And this is what God is calling us to do this morning, that we will follow him, we will be committed to follow him all the days of our lives. But as we follow him, we will learn along the way, and uh, we will be transformed, we will change, our lives will be different. And as they come to become different, that uh, they will have an impact uh, on the lives of other people. And this is basically what Apostle Peter was saying when in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, which was actually our call to worship, he says that like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. In other words, we are reminded that true discipleship is what we would call a sincere craving for spiritual growth, which, are, which is actually what John had. David didn't have it, but John had in the story we have mentioned. And uh, it goes beyond that now to also a commitment to live out our faith in a manner that that faith is going to be so authentic that it is going to make an impact in the relationships that we have. And um, it's basically what we would call uh, living in a very intentional manner. And there's somebody who said that the greatest hindrance to evangelism today is the gap between the gospel we preach and the lives we lead. The greatest hindrance we have today. You know, if any discipleship is going to take place, if any evangelism is going to take place, the greatest hindrance is the gospel we preach and the lives we lead. The gospel we preach must be reflected in the kind of lives we live. Praise be to God. And therefore, from the portion of scriptures that we have read, I want to mention three things that uh, we can consider as a, a requirement for discipleship. And number one is investment. Tell your neighbor, investment. When you go to the book of uh, Nehemiah, we see a people coming together. And in their coming together, they actually go to Ezra. They do not wait for the word to actually be brought to them, but they go in search for it. So they go to Ezra, and uh, from there now, the word is read for them. And as this word is being read to them, they listen, they learn, and uh, somehow they even uh, 
reflect about their own personal lives, they repent and they turn to the Lord. In fact, when they got to hear the word being read, they looked at their lives and in sorrow, they turn back to God. You know, in repentance, that indeed this is the kind of a life we have lived and we want to live differently. And any discipleship, it's important to note that discipleship starts with an investment. Praise be to God. Discipleship starts with an investment. Many times we invest and we invest in many things. If I wanted uh, to meet any financial goal that I have, I will consider various investment options. Perhaps I am going to enroll into a circle so that I can make some savings. Then thereafter, I can take a loan. And after getting that loan, I'll go. If my, uh, if my personal goal at that particular time is to buy a piece of land, then I'll go and buy it. And you can see how committed I am, you know, to invest in such a manner. If my personal goal is what I would call personal health, I'll be mindful of the kind of food I eat. I will even exercise. I might even decide, you know, to subscribe, you know, in a gym or something like that. Because that's my personal commitment. That's my goal at that particular time. You know, if I am desiring to grow in my profession, in my career, if that's what I want to build, I will consider... Uh, maybe subscribing uh, so that I can be able to get some more skills. Maybe I will consider further education. Or maybe I'll invest some time to read some books in the area of profession I am in so that somehow by the end of the day, I'll be able to achieve what I want. What about spiritual matters? In the same way, we must be willing to invest in the spiritual disciplines that are if we are going to grow spiritually. Praise be to God. Investment is important. And that is what is demonstrated by these people. And investment is not just investment for the sake of it. It comes with intentionality. So anytime I think about investing, I'll be so intentional. I'll be so deliberate about it. No wonder these people, they do not just wait. They do not just sit. And this reminds us that discipleship doesn't happen by accident. Discipleship is not a matter of chance. It requires intentional effort and focus. Praise be to God. It requires our investment on our way. And therefore, the questions I have for us this morning, my question number one is, how are you investing in your spiritual growth? How are you investing in your spiritual growth? You know, are there things that you need to do differently? Have you made the word of God a priority in your life to the extent that you'll rise up early? You know, even before you go to interact with other people that you will, you know, invest in your personal devotion to the extent that you will read the word of God. It doesn't matter whether it's a chapter a day or how many you commit yourself to. I know we are already doing CBL, some of us. I, are you keen, you know, to invest in that area? Are you a person who invests in the place of prayer, you know, where you go to meet with your father in heaven. Not because you are in a crisis. You know, sometimes uh, we are very reactive in our faith. Wait until there is a shake-up of a kind. And that's the moment you will be rushing, you will be running. No wonder, whenever things happen and they affect us as a nation, all of us will be posting in our status, let's pray for the nation, let's do this, let's do this. But God is calling us to move beyond being reactive Christians. Praise be to God. Discipleship is beyond a reaction. You know, and uh, we are also being reminded as, uh, as we make this investment that um, discipleship also goes beyond just reading the word of God, but also investing in the relationships that we have. Praise be to God. Who are your friends? What is the company that you keep? In the story we read, we have seen two friends. And uh, one, because of the kind of uh, life 
You know, he intentionally made, um, decided to leave. You know, he lives differently, and that has an impact in the life of his friends. Somebody said that you are an average of the five people you spend most of your time with. If those people are passionate about the things of God, if they are people who are keen to study the word, if they are keen to pray, if they are keen to attend fellowship, if they are keen to give their resources to serve, uh, to serve the Lord, if they are keen to, you know, to any spiritual discipline of a kind, you know, fasting, if they are keen to eat, then in your life, there is a way that will somehow rub on on you. Why? Because those interactions that happen there, they make a difference. It's so easy to keep company of people we go doing shopping together with, which is important, it's good, because we are here in this life. Sometimes we keep company of people we will go and watch, uh, you know, a favorite spot with. It's important, it is good. But how keen are we to also keep the company of people who can help us to grow spiritually? We must be intentional. Why? Because when we also think about uh, discipleship, Discipleship thrives in relationships and community. Praise be to God. No wonder in the instructions that we see um, um, being given uh, in the book of Titus by Paul, he's already instructing a community. You know, older women, men do this, and uh, that is all about relationship. It's all about a community. Because discipleship is not a journey that you've been called to walk alone. So investment is important. And perhaps we could also ask, what specific goals are you setting for your spiritual development? What specific goals are you setting for your spiritual development? And how are you contributing to the spiritual growth of the people you interact with? It could be in your home, the district fellowship where you attend, or even in a church like this. Investment is important. Number two is what we would call instruction. Tell your neighbor, instruction. And when we think about instruction, we note that discipleship isn't only about personal growth. Number one, for investment, we are looking at personal growth. But now we are also reminded that discipleship is not only about personal growth, it's about instructing others. No wonder the leaders in Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah, Ezra, and others, they are so intentional about how they instruct the people of God. And it is from this place of in, uh, instruction that they get to learn that somehow they turn to God. When we also think about what Apostle Paul is saying, uh, he's actually telling the believers, you know, those that are mature in the faith, the older ones, to instruct the younger ones so that they can grow, they can be mentored, they can learn, and somehow they can be able to also, in the same way, pass on the baton to others as they mentor them, as they raise them up. Who are you guiding in their faith journey? Who are you guiding in their faith journey? Do you have someone? Or is it just about you? That when I read the word, I feel good, I'm happy, I keep it. How can are we to share with other people? Maybe the people you meet with, do you take time to tell them, today in my personal devotion, this is what I was reading. And this is what I learned. This is how I've been challenged over this past one week. I attend many fellowships many times. And uh, sometimes I hear the leader of the service saying, it's an opportunity for testimonies. You know, it's an opportunity for people to share. And sometimes we realize that all of us say it, we are happy, we are good, we are comfortable. That moment passes and we move on to the next. And I believe that is a moment, it's an opportunity where I can be able to say and stand and say, you know, over this past one week since we were with you in the fellowship, I've been reflecting about this and this and this. And there is this portion of scripture that has challenged me in this way. You never know. As you share it out, you get to understand it even better. 
as you share it out, you also encourage others to be intentional and deliberate about their personal relationship with God, and somehow discipleship takes place. Instruction is important. Praise be to God. Finally, is influence. Tell your neighbor, influence. And perhaps I would even make it better and say, live a life worth imitating. Praise be to God. Live a life worth imitating. You know, there's a time Apostle Paul said that uh, be imitators of me as I imitate Jesus Christ. And I keep on asking myself one question. If this congregation that the Lord has entrusted to me to be its pastor, if they were to look at me, if they were to do the things I do, if they were to speak the way I speak, how would that congregation be? Would it be that they are imitating Christ as I faithfully also imitate him? Or where would be the gap in all that? Discipleship isn't just about knowledge. It isn't just about knowing the word of God. You can invest in reading the word of God, yes, because that's what we've talked about. But discipleship isn't just about knowing the word of God. We must live out the word of God on a daily basis. Praise be to God. Discipleship goes beyond what we would call, you know, just reading it and feeling good and excited and happy. It goes towards transformation. And discipleship is not a one-time event. It is a lifelong journey. In other words, it is a lifestyle. Praise be to God. You remember we started by saying that somebody said that the gap, you know, the hindrance uh, of uh, discipleship taking place, or true evangelism, so to speak, it is the gospel that we preach and the lives that we lead. And therefore, influence is paramount. Influence is very important. And we are reminded in Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, it says that in everything, set them an example by doing what is good. The question is, how does your life influence those around you? How does your life influence those around you? Does it influence them positively or negatively? Does it have an impact that would inspire them to love the Lord more? Does it influence them and impact them so that those that are struggling with issues of forgiveness, they will see how you are living your life and they'll be geared towards asking the Lord passionately to help them deal with issues of unforgiveness. And eventually, we begin to bear with one another, we begin to build one another, and we begin to work together. How is your life influencing those around you? Is your life motivating people, you know, to desire to attend fellowships? Because as they look at you, they can tell that on a daily basis you are growing. They can tell that even as you're given an opportunity to pray, you pray from a place of understanding. How is your life influencing your family, the people you work with, the district where you fellowship? Does it have an impact there? Is it making a difference? What about the church? where we always come on Sunday, and sometimes we interact outside the, the doors of this sanctuary. You know, at the canopy, and we are smiling, talking, sharing. Do those moments have an impact? Do they make a difference positively in the lives of the people we interact with? Today, the Lord is calling us to consider discipleship. And in considering it, invest. Number two, you do what? Mm -hmm. Instruct. Number three, uh -huh. influence. Number one, invest, instruct, influence. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.